Uh, everyone, today we have Xian Yi Cheng from CMU to uh, present to us. Uh, Xian Yi is a third year PhD student advised by Professor Matthew T. Mason. She received a master's degree in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University and a bachelor's degree in astronomical, uh, astronautical engineering from Harbin Institute of Technology. Her primary research interests include mechanics, planning, and optimization in robotic manipulation. Specifically, her current work focuses on generating versatile and robust dexterous manipulation skills. She is a recipient of Foxconn Graduate Fellowship. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome, Xian Yi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Um, can you enable screen sharing? Sure. Um, it seems I don't have the option here somehow. Um, while you're sorting, while you're sorting that out, let me just say something about Matt Mason, since I go back, way back with Matt that maybe Chang Yi doesn't know. But when I was just a couple of years older than you, I visited Matt at CMU, and I and I gave a talk. I stayed at his house, and we we had a great time. But he uh, we went to a juggling international juggling festival wow. because that's all kinds of fancy dynamic manipulation that Matt always liked. And and the thing, one of the things that came out of that was. In order for me to get into the, the juggling festival with Matt, <laughs> I had to join the, the International Juggling Festival. <laughs> and I didn't have much money and, and my, my wife was very upset with that choice of expenditure. So <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had a great time watching people juggle like even seven things at once. It was awesome. So Matt's been into this kind of stuff for a long time. Yeah, that's nice, but like, uh, okay, unfortunately, our work is still about like quasi static and quasi dynamic, dynamic <laughs> manipulation. So it's not those like exciting <laughs> dynamic manipulation yep. stuff. But yeah. you're, the, you're a pioneer and, and we'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. All right, um, go on, just okay. enable your sharing. Yeah, okay. Uh, Okay, can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Thanks, uh, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to like share and uh, discuss my work with you um, in the Air Lab. So my name is Xian Yi and I'm from the Manipulation Lab, Carnegie Mellon University. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, motion planning for dexterous manipulation. So basically, we want to automatically generate dexterous skills for uh, robotic manipulation. Okay, so. Um, okay, yeah, so um, we as human beings are like very creative in manipulating objects. A lot of times we probably don't even realize this because we're so good at manipulation. Um, so. Um, let's watch some videos to remind us how good we are at like dexterous manipulation and um, yeah. So pay attention to the contacts. This is grasping a bottle from a fridge. This is like utensil manipulation. And we can see some like um, contact guided placing here. And this is grasping a card. So um, these tasks seem simple, uh, but in fact, they are simple because um, the first three videos are from a paper called The Complexity of Grasping in the Wild. 
So the purpose of these tasks is to just grasp an object. But still, we can observe um, different non-prehensile manipulations behaviors. Like here, um, this person first uh, lever up the bottle and then grasp the bottle. So by non-prehensile manipulation, I mean uh, manipulating an object without grasping it. So, um, but in comparison, it's really hard for our robots to do that. So why, why it's hard for, uh, why our no robot cannot do uh, such dexterous manipulation? Um, so I think the first important thing, like planning, just planning the motion for um, dexterous manipulation is pretty hard. Um, I think there are two major difficulties. The first one is um, we see a lot of object environment interactions in these tasks. So which means that these tasks are like very environment dependent. And um, the next challenge is that there are many changes of context, including the robot hand contact and uh, environment contact. So I think um, these um, two problems are basically why most current methods cannot um, solve the planning for dexterous manipulation problem. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about like why current methods cannot solve dexterous manipulation problems. Um, I'm going to talk about like trajectory optimization, planning with motion primitives, and deep reinforcement learning like really quick. Um, so first, trajectory optimization. Uh, we all know like trajectory optimization are really good at like optimizing a trajectory with respect to some cost function. And um, a lot of like um, in the local motion community, uh, people use that a lot. So they also use that in for like contact implicit trajectory optimization where they can also um, do some optimization in terms of discrete contact changes. Um, but this does not, um, this cannot solve the, the manipulation problem, mostly because there are like just too many contact changes in the manipulation. And these changes are not periodic. Um, so it's even harder to plan that. A lot of times um, use trajectory optimization to solve like contact rich manipulation problem. They are often not able to find a feasible trajectory um, without like very good initialization, not to mention the like optimal trajectory. Yeah, that's trajectory optimization. Also, um, planning with motion primitives is a uh, um, popular method. Um, but because the dexterous manipulation problem is environment dependent, so it's kind of like not very practical to design a libraries of um, manipulation skills that can cover like all the dexterous the dexterity we need um, in different environments. And uh, another popular method is deep reinforcement learning. It also have this like environment dependent issue. Um, and also like, I think one important uh, problem is uh, the sparsity of rewards because like a lot of solutions for dexterous manipulation, they essentially leave on uh, like lower level manifold um, in the search space. So like sampling those motions um, are very hard. And um, it's very hard for like the deep reinforcement learning to get a reward uh, for such um, dexterous manipulation. Yeah. OK, so and um, in the rest of the presentation, I'll talk about our attempts to address these problems. So. Um, let me first explain uh, the task, tasks we're looking at. So basically, we have a start post of the object, and we have a goal post. And the question is, how does the robot get the object from its start post to the goal post? Um, is we, the object uh, initially in a box or something? A bin? Um, yeah, the start, the start post and goal post can be like anything like um, so in this, in this case, the object is, um, in a box. So the, 
the grayish uh, stuff are the environment and the red stuff, uh, red thing is the object. Yeah, so um, basically I assume that we know all the models, including the object mesh, the uh, environment model, and the robot kinematics and the robot collision model. Oh, by the way, please interrupt me if you have uh, any questions. And I also assume that the tasks are quasi-static or quasi-dynamic. So every motion we plan need to be quasi-static or quasi-dynamic. And I, um, we only consider non-sliding robot fingers, uh, which means that we do not plan like sliding um, robot finger motions. And there's only one movable object in the scene. And uh, yeah, so we don't we don't use any like manually designed motion primitives like like grasping, pushing, stuff like that. Um, we just like playing that from scratch. Also, there are like different tasks designed um, designed by like according to like uh, here is like uh, tasks designed by real life scenarios. So this one is like um, a peg out of whole tasks, and we can also like. Um, try to get a book out of, of the bookshelf or grasp a book from the table or the like grasp in a bottle from a fridge task. And um, we also want to cover some like object reorientation, including like object rolling tasks. And um, I'll also show something like for longer horizons. So basically these, okay. Question? I think I got a question here. Okay. You're muted. Yeah, I got it. Um, thanks. So just a question about what it means to be quasi-static or quasi-dynamic. As an example, if you look at the, uh, on the left side of your slide, the gray box, and you suppose you want to get the, the red peg out of the gray box, and suppose you could also magically pick up that box and tip it, if we could do that, would, would we allow gravity to pull it out of the box in a quasi-dynamic model? Yes, yes. So in the quasi-dynamic model, we allow some like very short period of um, dynamics, um, but uh, the velocity does not integrate into the next step. Okay, so basically, thanks. I assume that the velocity is zero like at every time, like the initial velocity is zero at every time step. Thank you. Yeah, so okay. Um, so this is our uh, these are our tasks, and okay. Let's first uh, look at like how would would us how would humans solve this problem? Uh, let's say we have um, let's say we have an object lying on the table. And um, we want to pick up this object, and this object is like a razor blade. So we don't want to cut our fingers. So a lot of time, we just choose to slide the object and then pick the object up. So what's the like human thinking process to solve this problem? Um, okay, so this process, this thing I came came up with is probably like debatable because I, I know nothing about like psychology and cognitive science. Um, but I think this uh, this is possibly like one way. Um, and we can use this as an intuition to like our method. So basically, we first like observe that the object is lying or like being supported by the flat table. And then we can imagine possible ways to move the object. Um, we can directly pick up the object or we can slide the object around because it's supported by a flat table. And um, then we, we think which way is possible. Can we directly pick up the object? Um, a lot of times, no, because we don't want to cut our fingers. So, we don't want to try this direct pickup motion, uh, but we can still slide the object because we can make um, contact with the object on its uh, top. And uh, we keep imagining, we can, ima we can slide the object around 
in our imagination or we can like actually try that. And when the object is near the edge of the table, its bottom surface is exposed. So um, we can then, we can again make the, um, have a go back, have a loop. Um, we can again observe that there's its bottom surface is exposed and then try possible ways to move the object. object. And in this case, we can directly pick up the object. Okay, so this is um, one way that we could like solve this problem. Um, and yeah, this is like the solution to this problem. And um, this thing has um, a nice correspondence to um, our method, like how would our robot solve this problem? So we observe um, the object lying on the table. This could be like the contact detection for the object environment. And we imagine possible ways to move the object. So um, in my case, I use the contact mode enumeration. I'll explain that later. But it's basically a way to um, enumerate the ways we can uh, move the object. And then we think, which way is possible? This is basically like we can sample robot object contact and do some feasibility tests, um, including like quasi static, quasi dynamic tests, and also probably like um, robot, um, the like collision tests. So, which way is possible? And we choose um, the possible ways and we try to do some like motion generation through numerical integration. That's, um, that's the like way to imagine how to move the object. And then we slide the object around. This is like a an, uh, rapidly exploring random tree. So we explore the possibilities of the object moving in a space. Okay, question. Are you exploring it moving around by pushing it and applying forces or contacts or just by letting the object move within simulation? Um, um, so yeah, so this is all like the plan, the whole planning process is, is done in the simulation. So that's, um, um, that's in the simulation for now. Um, but but in the simulation, the motion generation in the simulation, I also like needed to like satisfy the like force constraints. Um, so, so that means there is some sort of pushing object in the simulation that yeah. like a finger that pushes and, and it generates contact forces and things move according to some physics. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there are, uh, so in the simulation, but we can like also do that in the real world and yeah. Uh, so when the object is, uh, so in this process, we keep ob um, observing the environment is like extend um, a new node in the RRT. So this whole process is um, in the uh, the an iteration in RRT, like <clears throat> yeah. So I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna split the rest oh, of the can, talk in two parts. Oh, sorry, can we make a question? Okay. Uh, yeah. How do you? discard the option of picking up the object because it is not it is still possible but it is more difficult so going from step two to step three you discard yeah. the direct pickup but so we discard the direct pickup um so it's basically like um so for example in this case i can um have a like I can basically say that the object cannot, the, the robot cannot make contact with um, the object in its like short edges, like in those ed in those surfaces, um, because it's a it's a razor blade. And, and you then, do it, sorry, you do it. Um, you you give that input manually, or do you do it based on tests? 
So I give that input manually. Okay. Okay. That was yeah. <laughs> so I sample um, and I just so basically I sample the object uh, robot context for several times, and uh, so uh, so in this case I can only like make con I can only sample context on its top surface and bottom surface of the object, um, but its bottom surface is uh, like has collision. So it will be rejected. And all the contacts I can make is on the like top surface of the object. And then I do the like feasibility tests for um, quasi static or quasi dynamic motion. And it's not feasible to um, pick up the object with the contacts on the on its top surface. So in this way, I, I like sample that for like, for example, for 10 times. Um, there's no feasible way, and I'll discard the uh, direct pickup motion. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes, if it's uh, if the table is like too long or something, we sometimes tend to rotate the object, like we <laughs> press it on one end and then lift it up. Do you plan to consider these types of? Uh, Manipulative movements. Like yes. Okay. Yes. Actually, this this will happen in um, in some of our plans. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So the rest of the presentation, I'll split that in two parts. So the first part is about contact mode enumeration. Um, and how do we generate motions that's guided by the contact modes? And the next part is uh, about planning framework. Yeah, I know it's probably like, there are a lot of confusions, but I'll just, uh, I'll explain them later. Uh, okay, so first, um, um, contact mode enumeration. Um, basically contact mode, um, what are contact modes? Um, so contact mode is a way uh, to describe the relative contact motions in the system. Um, so here is an example in 2D. So in 2D, we have this block making two contacts with the table. And if the block is sliding to the left, the mode uh, for these two contacts will be left slide and left slide. And if the block is like rotating around this corner, uh, this contact mode will be separate and fixed. So basically in 2D, um, all, all possible modes for one contact is like fixed, right slide, left slide, and separate. And um, in 3D, um, so the contact mode, we can um, uh, have two parts to describe a contact mode. So the first part is describe whether this contact is maintained or this contact is separating. Um, and the second part is describing the sliding direction um, of the contact. So here's this an example. We have a particle um, on a flat surface. And um, if the particle, so this N here is the contact normal. If the velocity of this particle has um, some positive uh, component in this contact normal direction, this um, contact is uh, separating contact. Otherwise, the contact is uh, maintained. And if the contact is maintained, we can uh, look at its um, sliding directions. So um, for example, we can partition the uh, tangent um, plane of the contact, which is like, um, this gray plane um, into like using like two um, vectors. This is like uh, Tx and Ty. And um, we can basically uh, partition uh, and the sliding direction is gonna be, uh, okay, I'll just like draw. So we can basically part, uh, partition use the, this two vector to partition the tangent plane. And then like each sector 
is a sliding direction, is a different sliding mode for the contact. And yeah, so this, uh, I won't talk about the details for that, but this is uh, related to the like linearized uh, friction cone. So if we have like two vectors to partition the sliding plane, we'll have a four-sided friction cone. And if we have like four vectors, we'll have an eight-sided friction cone. Okay, so this is, um, this is the um, contact modes. And um, so um, our previous work found uh, something very interesting about enumerating all the contact modes. So basically the takeaway is that enumerating contact modes for a single object is feasible and uh, practical. Uh, basically for um, a sing single object, the computational complexity for um, contact mode enumeration is O and D in 3D and O and log N in 2D. The N is gonna be the number of contact modes and the D is the like effective degrees of freedom of the object. So, okay, yeah, question. And, and the environment now could be a robot hand with lots of degrees of freedom? Oh, no, 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 I'm just like- um, This is one object and a static environment? Yeah, so this is just okay. one object and static environment. Um, this also can be used for like the, um, for the robot, um, robot object contact um, manipulation, uh, sorry, contact enumeration. But this, uh, in, this, uh, in this case, the D would be like the freedom of the object plus the uh, freedom of the robot. Yeah, so I, I will not cover the details for the, like, um, for the algorithm, but some intuition is that um, because the contacts are like um, all like rigidly attached to an object. Um, so for example, we have, let's assume we have like four point contacts of the object. And um, let's consider the objects mo only making like translational motions on the surface. Um, and um, we will see that the sliding modes for all these four contacts is gonna be the same. Um, so they are not, the contact modes are not independent of each other. They are like couples. So that's why um, this um, algorithm, this computational complexity is not exponential um, to the number of contacts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and the like, and for this example, the effective degree of the object is one. So we'll see that there are more contacts in the system, but enumerating all possible contacts are like really easy. So it's just the object sliding in like the two directions. Yeah, so, so that's uh, enumerating, con kind of enumeration is feasible and practical. And uh, um, so this number is for reference, uh, the number of contact modes for one object in 3D is usually like 10 to 400. Um, so that's not too large. And um, our algorithm can enumerate them in uh, like uh, milliseconds. So yeah, that's contact mode enumeration. So the next uh, we have like, okay. Sorry, I forgot to m make this uh, animation here. <laughs> so it came out early. <laughs> um, so like why we care about contact modes. So like after I talk so much about contact modes. So um, one important thing is that um, one contact mode, if we specify the contact mode of a system, we can get continuous um, constrained um, dynamics of the system. So basically if we have the contact mode, uh, we don't need to like care about um, the possible discrete changes of the contacts. We um, don't need to like have um, these like complementarity constraints um, in the system. Um, that's all like continuous. And um, also we have this um, 
if we enumerate all kinematically feasible contact modes, um, we get all possible discrete transitions of contact formation in the current configuration. So um, this is basically saying that all contact modes can capture um, all these create transitions we have now. So this here we have an example. Um, if we um, look at all the contacting separating modes, we can have the object, we can have these two contacts both be separating. So the contact uh, will become like a line contact to like no contact. We'll have this contact separate and this contact fixed and we'll have this like um, line contact to point contact. It's like a pivoting motion. And if they are both maintained, we'll keep having this line contact. And this one is also like a pivoting motion. And uh, yeah, so these are like two nice things about contact modes, continuous dynamics and um, possible discrete transition. Um, and using those two nice things, um, we can do something very interesting. And here is uh, some sentence uh, I really like from uh, Professor Trinko's work in 91. Um, when Don't she's like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry? Don't say the year, that's 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but I really like this. And I think the core, the philosophy of like our stuff here is the same as um, this thing in, in that, in this like 91, in a, in a work in 30 years ago. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the core idea is to um, decompose the search space into smaller chunks. In our, um, in our case, the smaller chunks are each contact mode. So they have continuous dynamics. So we decompose the search space into smaller chunks and um, these smaller chunks can be searched individually and independently. And later we can combine those smaller chunks um, to have a complete solutions. And in this case, we can like search those, um, um, the like discrete transitions here help us to decompose um, the search space. And we, I'll later use an, an RRT to form a complete solution. Um, uh, with for this like uh, using those smaller chunks, yeah. Um, okay, so this is why we care about contact modes, and basically we can like effectively use contact modes to generate uh, various motions. So it's like how do we um, explore those like smaller chunks in inside each contact mode? So let's say we have like a randomly sampled object pose, and we want to um, move the object as close as possible to the like sampled um, pose. And we consider that for each contact mode um, here. So for like the both contact separating mode, um, we can have a motion like this, move the object as, as close as possible and um, for the object contact uh, maintained, we can have this um, sliding motions. And for only one contact maintained, we can have something like this um, pivoting motions. Again, this is like very simple 2D example, but we can see like um, the contact, mode, the enumerated contact modes can um, do what motion primitives do. So they're like pre-designed motion previous and they can guide uh, the motion generation process. Again, this is another example where um, we only look at one contact mode. So the contact mode, uh, so the red, the yellow ones are um, the environment contact. So uh, the mode we're considering is separate and left slide and um, we have a uh, robot contact. We have two robot contacts here, the blue contacts. And so this is our start configuration. And let's say um, one go configuration is the object being flipped. 
And another Go configuration is the object in the air. Um, by trying to get these um, objects as close as possible um, inside this contact mode um, to those Go configurations, um, we'll get those like solid blocks and they are the closest configuration they can get within this contact mode. So basically what we do here is like, we can do some, um, um, we can do some numerical integration process. And um, so this um, blue, this blue thing is the like um, all possible configuration the object can reach under one contact mode. And every time at, so inside the numerical integration at every time step, we move as close as possible um, to the goal configuration. So this is basically solving some like, um, so at every time step, we solve some QP uh, quadratic programming to get the best velocity towards the goal configuration under the constraints um, of under the force and velocity constraints um, imposed by the contact modes and we integrate that velocity into the object. Um, yeah, so this is the process of like, um, how do we generate motions um, inside one contact mode? Again, they're like pre-designed motion primitives. They constrain the motion um, in the like lower level uh, manifold in, um, the object configuration space. So, saying a quick question: um, mm -hmm. This manipulation manifold is attached to this starting configuration, right? If you shift, the yeah, this is attached. This is attached to the starting <laughs> configuration, and it's different for every starting configuration. I see. Right. Thank yeah. You. And this is how we generate motion inside one contact mode. And yeah, so two nice thing about contact mode. Um, this continuous dynamics given by one contact mode can ensure solutions to be found on those like zero man volume manifold in the configuration space. Um, so um, because those manifolds are of like um, lower dimensional um, compared to the configuration space. So if, um, so the possibility of like sample, sampled um, those solutions is zero. So in this way, we can ensure those solutions to be found. And also um, because um, all kinematically feasible contact mode um, capture the all possible discrete transitions um, of contacts, we can effectively explore the discrete and continuous spaces guided by those um, contact modes. Yeah. Um, so that's the first part about contact modes. Um, so basically, again, we observe, we do the collision detection, we observe some contacts, and we do contact mode enumeration to find out possible ways to move the object. And then we can put this into a bigger planning framework. So yeah, um, in, in the bigger planning framework, um, some one one um, one thing I'm really happy about this framework is that um, is its simplicity. Um, this is just a regular RRT with some um, with some modifications, um, and this mod and it, there's no like very complicated design, and um, there's no like some novel tricks. But I'll show later that it still work for um, many tasks. Okay, so the RRT framework. So basically um, in RRT, we'll have a tree and uh, we will randomly sample an object post in the, in the object configuration space. And we'll find the, its nearest neighbor in the tree. So that's X near and, well, and we'll enumerate um, contact modes. So in this case, uh, we will um, explore every CS mode. So again, every CS mode capture a discrete transition of the uh, states of contacts. 
we extend every CS mode and we try to get as close as possible to the randomly sampled object configuration. So, and also like inside the extend function, we will, um, this is what the extend function do. We will check um, which way is feasible. We'll discard um, the not feasible, the non-feasible um, contact modes. Um, so basically here we do, we sample some ob robot object contacts and do some feasibility tests. And we keep imagining that's um, the motion generation through um, numerical integration. So that's basically what the extend function does. Okay, so um, next I'm gonna um, explore the extend function in, with more details. Um, I practiced this for several times, but I still think my explanation is probably like boring and maybe a little bit confusing, but like the important thing to remember is that um, the extend function is just like sampling robot object um, contacts through like rejection sampling techniques and do some feasibility tests and then do motion generation. That's basically all about this extend function. And that's the only part we modify in this RT tree. Question? And when you say you do feasibility tests, I again, I assume those are, you would put some input into a simulator and make sure that, that sliding happens or sticking happens at the contacts. Or, or um, maybe you'd observe it on the real system. I don't know. I think so. So the feasibility tests, um, yeah, it's it's similar. So I basically um, the feasibility test is like just uh, um, I like yeah, it's like putting the things into the simulation, but not exactly in the simulation. I I basically just solve some like um, linear programming or quadratic programming problems to see if there's a solution. And, and, that's and so, so that basically, I mean, I'm asking this question because if you wanted to just arbitrarily choose a contact mode and search in that direction, it could be that you'll find out very quickly that the contact mode's not feasible for any input. Yeah, right. Right, okay. Yeah, so it's the same. I do the tests and uh, if it's not feasible for any input, I'll just like discard this contact mode. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Another question here. Um, when you start to expand the RRT, you might find that you can switch the contact mode, right? Like when you start to push uh, close to the table, then you there is a point when you can start lifting the object. Do you take into account that switching in the mode during the RRT expansion? Yeah. So during the um, numerical integration, We'll consider that. Um, so, for example, if the goal is to push the object, but um, like because we do this feasibility feasibility test, we make sure that this motion can happen. Um, but like during the like numerical integration, if the rock if the object is hitting a uh, like new surface, is making new contacts, um, the numerical integration will just stop there. And if there are like some like unexpected um, things happening, um, the numerical integration will also stop. And if if the, the goal is to like just pivot the object, we already know this contact is separating. So um, we don't care if this contact is maintained or we just, we even want this contact to be disappeared. Yeah. So, so that, when you do the planning, you do only one, one contact mode, right? That's what. Yeah, so we do the extend function for like one contact mode. Okay. But you also enumerate all, con all possible contact modes. Right? That's the point of this um, yeah. planning method. So you can basically scan through all the possible contact modes. Um, um, and then uh, within each content mode, you can do those feasibility tests and so on. You yeah, know, exactly. To the extent. So it's something like that, I think. Uh, by the way, I think um, uh, David's question is twofold, right? The first is, um, uh, the second part is about content mode, uh, but the first part I think is about the content locations, right? Or the number of content points. 
So do you do some uh, special things to switch the number of contact points and the location um, during the planning? You mean like um, robot, robot, uh, robot object contact? Yeah, robot object contact. You said the contact points are all fixed, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll, um, I'll talk. Yeah, that's that's inside the that's in the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to explain this. Uh, um, yeah, this is um, um, so this is extend function again. This extend function just like is like um, find out uh, all possible ways that we can move the object. So uh, we do that for every contacting separating mode. So when we extend every CS mode um, in the extend function, I'll first figure out what is the best sliding mode. Uh, because like the sliding mode is like just a, a like um, linearization of the like um, sliding direction and the friction cone. So, um, we it's um, there are like a lot of sliding modes and we want to like uh, filter out. And so here is an example. Um, if the object is con um, contacting the surface um, and we can have like sliding mode of like sliding to the left, sliding to the right, but because the um, sampled pose is on the right of the object, have this uh, mode be left sliding is not is not taking the object to anywhere, so we can safely um, filter out that mode. So that's basically the um, finding out the best sliding mode function, and then we have um, um, then we get a full contact mode out of this, um, and then after that. Um, we consider the robot object contacts. Um, if there's no contact assigned, we will uh, randomly sample some contacts, robot object contacts. And if there are previously assigned um, manipulator contacts, they could be like from um, the user defined, we have an initial location of the uh, robot contact, or it can be like randomly sampled uh, by our algorithm. And then we want to like check if the motion is feasible, um, just do the feasibility tests. And we also want to check if the manipulator is feasible, which is like, uh, is there an I inverse kinematic solution? Are there collisions with um, the environment or with the object? And if there's no, uh, if there's if there's no if the feasibility test failed we'll try to relocate the manipulator contact um so inside the relocation of the manipulator contact we'll try that for like several times we will randomly sample um fingers to relocate to a like random um place on the object and um inside this relocation we'll also check uh, if there are like feasible IK solution or feasible, uh, uh, make sure there's no collision. So yeah, so basically this part is all about like randomly um, sample object um, robot contact uh, with rejection. And then um, if we have a feasible uh, robot contact that can execute um, the motion, we then um, proceed to um, the like um, this project into integration process. And if no, we'll just like discard this contact. Um, so inside the project project integration process, it's just like it's just generating a trajectory that get as close as possible to um, the sample post. Yeah, that's uh, basically about the uh, extend function. Um, any question about that? Okay, nice. So we use this extend function to generate uh, motions for every CS mode. And yeah, I'm going to explain this method more with um, what with this example. Um, 
So we have a star post for this. We have a square peg in the square box. And the goal post is to get the object out of this box. And I assume the robots. Uh, so for simplicity first, um, there are like two flying balls. And it, uh, so in this case, it can have collision with the object, but it cannot have collision with the environment. So, um, so here's our uh, results, one of our results from the planner. So I can, oh. so yeah, so let's look at what happens here. Uh, so like first, um, because, uh, so first uh, we made observations. We have four contacts uh, for, the, for this peg with the box and we can enumerate those contact modes. Um, for example, the contacts can be like all separating, which is picking up the object. And we do, we try to extend this mode and we'll quickly find that we cannot sample a collision-free um, robot contacts um, that's also feasible for this contact uh, for this contact mode. Um, in this case, because there are collision. Uh, yeah, question. Just just for clarity, I, I assume those green spheres are just for visualization, and it's just points that zero-dimensional points that are you're using for these fingers now. Um. Or are you they using are, that full geometry? They have volume, that's their geometry, and they can collide with the environment. But so then, I, I assume they cannot collide with the, uh, the object. That's then, just uh, for simplicity, yeah. Then what's confusing me is why those balls are, are penetrating the red box. Yeah, that's, that's because the visualization, um, I'm like showing these like, um, I'm showing those spheres. Uh, I'm like having this, like the center of the spheres on the like object. Um, so um, yeah, in this context, in this like, uh, in this case, I'm assuming these like, um, these uh, contacts can, can penetrate the object, can have like collision with the object, but they cannot collide with the environment. But later I will show like uh, okay. more like uh, realistic ones. Yeah. Right. Since I do simulation a lot, uh, I think what's going on here is probably um, the contacts are soft in the simulator. Is that right? Um, I'm not using any simulator. I'm just like no. using. Uh, oh, so it's just visualization. Yeah, yeah. I write my own like uh, numerical integration process. This is just for visualization. And these contacts, I assume they are all just like point contacts. Yeah. So um, uh, will the contact force change if the penetration depth changes? No, they will not. They are, uh, so they are, so I basically have um, like, uh, so I basically have like a linear programming uh, thing to like compute the contact forces. So that's um, computed and uh, so it, does not, I, I always assume the like contact has like zero like penetration. Okay, so this is just like a visualization. Yeah, that's just the visualization. Okay. So uh, I have another question. Yeah. How do you choose the places where you uh, put the points? So I will, um, so basically if I have an object mesh model, I will sample, um, I will uniformly sample points on the object surface. So there are like usually 100 to 200 candidate points on the object surface. And uh, that's those candidate points for like sampling robot object contacts. Okay. Yeah. And then you try with all those samples? I mean, you yeah, try I, I, I randomly sample them. Okay. So let me just, for operational purposes, I, I'm not sure how far away you are from the end of your talk, Yan Yi, but maybe everyone could hold off on questions so she can get to the to the punchline at the end. Okay, yeah. So I'll probably just like 
um, skip the explanation <laughs> here. So we can see that uh, see that the um, the object first make contacts with only with the like uh, top surface with the um, peg because there's no other ways to make con uh, there's no other collision free ways and feasible ways to make contacts. So um, the peg just slide um, to one side so that um, oh that's the other one. Uh, so that the object can make, uh, so that the robot can make uh, contact with the other, with the side of the pack and uh, pick it up. That's uh, quite similar to the human manipulation strategy um, in the real world. Mm -hmm. So it's also like sliding the box to the edge and then like grasp it. And we can also even observe that there's a contact change here because this top contact does not support the sliding up um, motion anymore because the, um, this, uh, this like, environment contact has moved down. So um, this, uh, this robot finger uh, further moves down to like, support this uh, motion, which uh, we can see like nice cor correspondence here in the like, human manipulation strategy. She also like, uh, put the finger down to slide up the object. Yeah, and uh, I also have like more tasks. So this is grasping a book from the bookshelf. And this is a similar strategy uh, for a human. This is grasping that with a parallel geographer. So this time we don't have penetration. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's parallel geographer with and there's a similar strategy used by a human with only two fingers. This is pick up a book. This is a similar strategy in human manipulation. And, oh, okay. Um, and I think this, this this, yeah, this is to grasp a bottle. So we need to like first pull this uh, bottle out to have um, a collision-free grasping pose. And this is a similar human strategy. And uh, this is some like just reorientation tasks. This is not very interesting, this task. Yeah, but here I, we can see that uh, it also works for um, like um, uh, irregular object, not just for cubes and blocks. Um, so this is a hex bot and the input is an object mesh. And this also works well for rolling. And yeah, also it can uh, deal with longer horizons. And this, um, yeah, this is a really, little bit nasty because we see a lot of randomness um, that's caused by the RTs. That's uh, future work. Um, but um, another um, way to look at this is that our method is able to plan the motion with many, many contact changes, which cannot be done with uh, trajectory optimization. So this, um, this is not like strictly regrasp. I'm just like trying to rerun these objects with a parallel jaw grouper. Um, this is like showing that it works for like different object, uh, different robot models. And uh, we can also like deal with uh, quasi dynamic tasks. Mm. So for this, like for this um, place down tasks, we need to have this short period of uh, dynamics to let the um, gravity works. And so this flip and pinch task is, um, is like this. I'll also show that later in a robot experiments, but in uh, a human manipulation, it's like this. So 
yeah um yeah so robot experiments i also try this with um the like uh robo model with a direct drive dexter's hand so this hand has four degrees of freedom and um two pairs of fingers so this is the the plan trajectory to get a book out of a bookshelf. And this is an, an open loop execution with just position control. And this is the flip and pinch grasp. So basically here, one uh, finger relocates really fast. Uh, we see some impact here, that's not expected, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I also have like uh, some more robot experiments that we previously do in 2D and uh, we execute that with a hybrid force velocity controller uh, with just point fingers. So this is trying to get a block um, through the obstacle with just one point finger. Yeah, also, um, so yeah, this slide is just to show, show you the planning time for each task. So mostly um, the task can be planned within like 10 seconds, but for longer horizon tasks, this task 10 is the like uh, object and stairs task it takes um, about a minute. But overall, compared with like um, most trajectory optimization, they are like intractable or like takes like tens of minutes. Um, I think this is pretty good. Yeah, okay, so I guess I'm out of time. So I'm gonna briefly talk about like future directions. Um, I'm also thinking about like doing full dynamic dexterous manipulation. Uh, with this type of techniques, we can also use contact modes to find out possible um, motions of the object and do some like trajectory optimization on top of that to get fully dynamic stuff. And I'm um, also possibly uh, considering the dexterity from sliding and rolling of robot contacts. Um, so of course we see that because of the RT nature, we have a lot of randomness um, in the plane, so I'm considering like uh, doing some post processing. And also, um, some motions are not robust. They, um, we although we do the feasibility tests, they are probably not robust uh, to uncertainties like friction. Um, so I'm also like studying the robustness of uh, contact fish motions. So in conclusion, um, we propose a contact mode guided planning framework for um, dexterous manipulation. And the core uh, is that this method explores the contact modes to explore um, lower dimensional manifolds and to automatically generate motion that uh, are often pre-designed as motion primitives. And um, I think this method is pretty simple and general and fast uh, for um, various complicated manipulation tasks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Since we're over time, why don't we just take a couple and then uh, I imagine that Jinda and I might have more detailed questions that we can carry on, you know, through mm -hmm. email thread or something. Yeah, I can also stay for longer. If, uh, yeah. So yeah. Um, I have I'm going to ask you a question. Um, as you said, um, um, you're planning to do um, robot object um, contact, which is not fixed, right? Sliding or uh, rolling. Uh, what challenge do you say here um, in this? You mean like of... robot contacts? Yeah, robot and uh, object contacts. Right? Yeah, I think the main the main challenge is that oh. um, you like introduce more variable to the planning process, which is going to make the the things like um, really tricky, because like for slide, if you want to play like sliding robot contact you need to consider like 
um, the basically the velocity of the like um, of the robot sliding. And let's see if you are sliding the object as well as like oh no that that uh, let's say you are like many rotating an object with a sliding finger, and you need to consider the like velocity relative to the uh, the velocity of the like sliding finger relative to the like velocity of the like object. So I think that's um, one issue, and we probably. If we want to plan um, sliding finger, we we'll probably need a sub planner inside those um, uh, the extend function or inside the like motion generation within a contact mode. I see. Thank you. Um, and my second second question is: uh, you mentioned the uh, the algorithm is really fast, uh, but you also use a lot of uh, point robots, right? Uh, what if we have dexterous hands uh, instead of uh, point robots? Will the algorithm still be fast? <laughs> yeah, so um, so basically, I think, okay. Uh, so I think here, uh, oh, here. so um, in the robot experiments here, I have a, like, that. this is like a dexterous hand. So I, I solve for like those like IKs. As long I think is if the IK is fast, the thing um, I think it can be fast, but not reason, like as yeah, fast as the like point contact. The reason I'm asking is because if we imagine a robot hands just like human hands, right? We have a lot of degrees of freedom. Yeah. And then um, and then uh, you know we need to consider the uh, kinematics and also the collision of the links, not just the the, the contact in point, right? So uh, I think that can cause some trouble there. I think the main the main trouble for um, for a human like hand for um, to planning motions for that is um, we cannot just do like this pinch grasp or like pinch point manipulation. We need to consider the contact of the hand itself. Uh, yeah. with the object. I think that's that's the main challenge and I haven't like figured out how to how to do that. Because like if you want to have the, this part uh, contacting the surface, you need to have like different IK. Yeah. Um, and if you consider all possible contacts with uh, the robot hands, yeah, I don't know how to do that. This is like very challenging. Um, but for like, if we want to consider like, robot uh, the collision of all the links and the like ik for all the fingers to like manipulate and uh dexterous like using um like our methods here um it's going to slow down the process and it's going to uh, limit the um the candidate contact points on the object right yeah it is going to do that um but i think this method can can solve that uh, there's like no um it's just the um, like an uh, embodiment uh, uh, limitation it's not about the method right it's just the robot can't facilitate those kind of points and in those cases you know the uh, the, the the um there's no feasible solution probably yeah yeah but yeah anyway just just myself <laughs> mm -hmm. question yeah, I'd like to take this back a little bit to what you mentioned about RRT, and we know that RRT produces rather crude paths, and, and mm -hmm. that some optimization can be helpful. Um, do you think that, you know, RRT has this variant RRT star, which is as you as you sample onto infinity, that eventually you asymptotically mm -hmm. converge to an optimal solution? Um, yeah. But I'm wondering if you know or have thought about whether by doing this sampling on manifolds and you know the, the the adaptations you've made to rrt i'm wondering if you could simply apply rrt star and expect to have it it also produce optimal solutions for you in the long run or whether maybe that kind of optimization is now broken because of these the manifold structure of the space yeah yeah exactly um i don't think rrt star we can use rrt star for that 
because um, like for uh, for two, you I think it's basically like very hard to like um, con arbitrarily connect the two fun configurations um, because they are both live in like the, the like lower level manifolds and um, um, a lot of times like for example for this extend function. I would say like 99% of time, it cannot get exactly to the X, um, to the randomly sampled post. So the same also applies uh, when we want to like connect um, two nodes in the RRT star. Sure, okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to ask a related question if I could. Mm -hmm. So so now, now I'll assume that you'll have to make your own method, the, the Cheng method for optimization of these kinds of, of manipulation plans. And yeah. Then once you've made your method that works well with models where you know all the models exactly, which is where you stand now, I think, at least mm -hmm. with what you presented today, mm -hmm. it's also kind of known that when you have an optimal solution for a particular model, that that optimal solution might be very fragile to uncertainties or, or errors in that model. Have you right. thought about that? Yeah, so um, I just wonder if you've thought about that and whether there might be some approach for optimization of trajectories that would be robust to some class of changes in the geometry in your yeah. model. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this problem. So basically like, I think the ro robustness we need to like um, consider here is like the robustness across <laughs> contacts. Like, um, because like um, when there are uncertainties, it's very um, easy for the context to, the modes of context to be changed. Like, mm -hmm. can we have something robust across contact modes? Uh, so, um, Actually, in our experiments, we also observe some motion that's um, robust. Um, for example, if we, if we are like trying to tilt an object in a corner, um, let's say if the like expected contact, mode, I'll, I'll do it this way, like expected contact mode um, is like both of them are in contact and sliding. But mm -hmm. what actually happened in reality is a lot of times this contact will just be like separating and then it drops back mm -hmm. and then it slides back. But this motion can still be um, robust. And um, so I think that's a like very interesting problem. Um, so can we find, can we have a criteria to tell that if this motion is robust across um, different contact modes, different contact changes. And can we find um, a good control that make this motion as robust as possible? Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting problem. I've been like studying this problem for uh, this whole semester and still um, couldn't figure out <laughs> how to do that. Um, yeah, this is, a. Uh, in terms of trajectory optimization, um, I would expect that the time we spend on trajectory optimization will probably take more than this like planning process. Um, mm -hmm. Because to have like some sort of optimization, we must uh, optimize uh, across those contacts. And yeah, I haven't uh, thought of like a very good way to do that. <laughs> Any other question? Well, then let's, oh, I, I see a hand. And one question about the real robot experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you consider the motion of the NA factor or the manipulator itself uh, during the planning? Because we see in the real robot experiments, the, uh, the manipulator needs to move very fast sometimes to, to change the contact point between mm -hmm. the object and uh, the NA factor. Uh, did yeah. you, how do you account that? Yeah, so this is like, um, so I guess the question is like, um, do I consider the relocation 
um, yes. motion for uh, when I'm trying to like change the con robot uh, um, robot uh, manipulator contacts. Yes. Um, so I was so now I don't consider that. I just assume the context can be like changed uh, immediately to the um, um, to another location on the um, object. But I think um, a modification could be easily fit in this framework. Um, so basically, in the function of relocate in this function here, relocate manipulator, I will need a sub planner to generate a collision free um, trajectory for the robot to make the transition. Um, so like, let's see, I have the robot uh, contact here and I want to make contact here. And I want to have like a sub planner that generate this trajectory and make sure there's a feasible trajectory that um, can make that transition or so like collision free. Um, yeah, so that's a, a good add on to this method, but uh, I don't have that for now. So in the like robot, uh, in the robot experiments, I just uh, hand code one way point um, that's collision free to the um, object. Um, so saying um, related um, to, to Java's question, I think uh, in the real world experiment, when the contact point switches, uh, the object didn't move. So uh, do you assume that the rest of the contact points will just support the object during the transition? Yeah, yeah. So um, inside this relocate um, manipulator function, I a successful relocate will need to satisfy that the rest of the fingers um, can support the object. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So maybe if there's no uh, further questions, let's thank Shen Yi for her presentation. Thanks, thank everyone. I think this is really interesting work um, yeah. for text source manipulation. Yeah, if you have time, I, will, I can stay uh, for longer to answer more questions. Yeah. All right, yeah. great. I'll do what we can. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you okay, so thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.